Good morning. The party's over. Quiet down. <laughs> Just kidding. Keep the noise going. It's Palm Sunday. It is a big party. It's a parade. Everybody was gathered around the street, waving their palm. Yeah. Yeah, try it. Just practice. All right. We are going to be waving our palms two different times when the choir sings the introit and during uh, the hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. If you can hold your book and wave, fine. If you'd rather just wave, do that. If you'd rather just sing, do that. Whatever works for you. There are a couple announcements. The progressive dinner hasn't had very many sign-ups yet. So the group is going to decide what to do tomorrow. So if you want to be part of the progressive dinner, please make it to the best Fulton room downstairs and sign up. And then they'll make a decision about uh, what to do. Strategic planning groups met this week. Uh, the strategic planning group met this week. We divided into small groups. We would like everyone to be part of a group. So find uh, Amy or someone else on the council and let uh, them know of your interest in the strategic planning groups. Our Monday Thursday service occurs this week, Thursday at 7 o'clock. I know, it's the same time as pub theology, but just like in the rest of the world, there are choices to be made. So choose, pub theology happens a lot, Monday, Thursday happens once a year. Still, go to pub theology if you want to. It's a great conversation, it happens over at Reedy's. Um, if you're coming to the Monday, Thursday service and you'd like to be a reader, Please see me after worship in the coffee hour in the Best Fulton Room. I have parts. You can pick them up today and be prepared for Thursday evening. I think that's all the announcements. Oh, Chris. Easter dinner. We need volunteers, I'm guessing. No, just remind people they want to eat that If you want to eat on Easter, on Easter, Talk to Chris. She's got it all figured out. <laughs> no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please get your palms ready. Come seeking words.
Come, come, O Holy One, come through the streets. Come into the house, come to find the space beside us at the table. Come to challenge our answers about what tragedy strikes. Why poverty increases, why we are afraid. Come, O Holy One, speak to us in the silence. With wisdom greater than ours, love deeper than ours, and a change wider than ours. You're invited to sing together from number 213 in your hymnal in front of you in the seats, and wave your palms if you like. It's lovely to see. Thank you so much for daring to bring your inner child out this morning. I'm looking for the short people, like me, the short people. Anyone who wants to come up? You older short people may come up too if you want to. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for coming up. I'm going to um, stand over here so you could slide over that way. Good. So this morning, it feels a little bit like a parade, doesn't it? Yeah. And so if you were going to go to a parade, what would you bring today? Probably not a branch like that, right? What would you bring? A blanket to sit on. That's a good idea. A what? A picnic. a picnic. What a great idea, Mom. Are you listening? <laughs> what else would you bring? Uh, yeah, Grandma goes to work, and you go to the parade by yourself? Well, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. What would you bring? Some other people. What a great idea. A camera to take pictures, excellent. Well, back in the day, 
They didn't necessarily have all those things. But what they had that we have today is things from the earth. And so these palms were a way that they could make a big showing at the parade when they liked what was going on. Now here's the thing. If we don't take care of our earth, then we won't have palms like this. We won't have the opportunities to be together for a parade. We won't have good food to eat. We won't have the bees like Shirley shared with us last week, right? So this month of April is Earth Month. Here's a piece of paper for each of you. I want you to tell me what's on it. Yeah, the Earth is on that one. What's on that one? A rainbow and the earth. What's on that one, Linnea? The earth and plants. What's on that picture? Uh, An earth. Wyatt, what's on this picture? An earth. Yes, Colton. What's on that picture? Flowers, Flowers and, and earth. Yeah. So our coloring pages for today are the earth. And I have a whole bunch more coloring pages. I'm going to ask you to bring those and set them back on the table back there for anyone who wants to stay. Oh, you can wait till we're done in a second. Sorry. Such a good direction follower. Um, for anyone who wants to stay in this space during the service, there are crayons and coloring pages back there that you can use, or you can go with the children to uh, Godly Play, and Olivia's going to take you in just a minute, but I have a little treat for you before you go. Oh, I have to figure out how to get them out of here. It's a trick. It's an adult-proof package. Here it is. All right. Each of you is going to have a sticker to take with you. And it says, every day is Earth Day. So you can wear this. You can take it to remember Earth Day on April 22. But every day is Earth Day. Want a sticker? Sweet. Sticker, Colton? There you go. Lene, you want to bring some for your siblings? All right, here you go. You're welcome. Okay, children, have a good time at Godly Play. Follow Olivia. The first reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 1 through 6. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the legal experts were looking for a way to kill Jesus because they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went out and discussed with the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard how he could hand Jesus over to them. They were delighted and arranged payment for him. He agreed and began looking for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them, a time when the crowds were absent. So ends the reading. This begins the contrast of Holy Week. We begin with the parade, and it's big, and it's joyous. 
and pretty quickly it gets somber. One of the um, things that the story of Judas helps us to understand is that our resources are important. They can be used for good or evil. Some say that the 30 pieces of silver that Judas sold Jesus for was a day's wages. Feels like not very much. Some people say it was more like a month's wages. But here's the thing. We know at the end of the story, Judas wasn't happy about his decision. So either he didn't sell Jesus for enough, or he felt guilty for selling Jesus at all. How we use our resources is important. We're grateful for all of you who make a contribution to this church's regular offering plate. It keeps the church going. It helps us to be able to do God's work in the world. There are several other opportunities for you to consider using your resources. One is the United Church of Christ One Great Hour of Sharing. You may remember the flyer was in the uh, program last week. It, can, it helps the United Church of Christ address disasters in our world. You can still contribute, little envelope, One Great Hour of Sharing. It's written in your program. And finally, I want to alert you to an opportunity that's coming up next Sunday. Uh, there will be a special offering announced to contribute to the seminary intern that we have, Adam Drosha's um, uh, stipend that he receives, and uh, the CE people that we support that help us with godly play upstairs, Olivia and Amy. So next week you'll hear more about those, but I wanted to make sure that it was in the back of your mind so that you'd be prepared for that next week. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Jesus made his way to the Mount of Olives, as was his custom, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived, he said to them, pray that you won't give in to temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Jesus said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not my will, but your will must be done. Then an angel appeared to Jesus and strengthened him. He was in anguish and prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like drops of blood falling onto the ground. When he got up from praying, Jesus went to the disciples. He found them asleep, overcome by grief. Jesus said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. We follow in Jesus' model of bringing our deepest desires before God during this time. I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer. Take a deep breath and feel God's presence very, very close. And know that you are connected to the whole world. God, this morning we thank you for the sun shining brightly after days of clouds and rain. And we're aware of the crispness of a chilly day. We're grateful that we could get out of bed this morning and we acknowledge the aches and pains as we begin to move about. We're grateful for a warm and safe 
place to live, and we also know the worry and care of maintaining that place. We live in this small town because we can be known and know, but we also experience the isolation on occasion from the rest of the world. We're grateful that our children have schools where they can learn and socialize, and we also experience the controversy that comes up about what to teach and who has authority. We're grateful for law enforcement and the fire department who keep us safe. And we're sad that there has to be such agencies due to crime and accidents. We're grateful that we can get news at a moment's notice. And we also experience the paralysis when we dwell on it. We're grateful for the opportunity to bring prayers before you, and we know that there are some for whom no one ever thinks to pray. We know that there are some that are named both in our program and on the prayer cards. They include Kate Jones, Tom Jones's wife, who's in the hospital with pneumonia. She's doing well, replying to texts and email, hint, hint, and Terry Coleman, friend of Audrey and Mary, who's having tests for possible lung cancer. God, we bring all of these things before you, the contrasts in our lives that make it beautiful and full of anguish, and we realize that our prayers are biased. And so we lift up a prayer that Jesus taught all his disciples using the words printed in our program or the words that are comfortable for you. We say together, Beloved, our mother and father, in whom is heaven, hallowed be your name, followed be your royal way. Done be your will and rule throughout the whole creation. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us, for you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir, for reminding us of that ancient story. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, it's a big parade, and his suffering comes right on the heels of that event. That's the ancient reading. The contemporary reading for today comes from a Palestinian-American poet named Naomi, Naomi Shihab Nye and her poem called Kindness. Listen for the contrast between kindness and sorrow. Before you know what kindness is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead. By the side of the road, you must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the threads of all sorrows, and you see the size of the cloth, then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread, only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you've been looking for and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. I kind of wish I didn't have to preach. That's a good one, isn't it? The contrast that we heard the choir sing about, the contrast in uh, Naomi uh, Shihab Nye's poem, it's replicated throughout our world. We print books on white pages with black letters because the contrast is easier to see that way. It's easier to read. But there are other contrasts. Robin Wall Kimmerer points to the contrast between the purple aster and the goldenrod, which grow together so that the bees can see them more clearly. There are other contrasts. We can only know pleasure if we also know pain. We can only know love when we've known hate or the fear of being alone. We perhaps can only know joy against despair. Dan and I have compared notes about Holy Week and our growing up in the same Christian tradition West Michigan, that gives you a clue. We mostly went from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday without all those dark days in between. Of course, we knew that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins and that Jesus rose on Easter to take the punishment for all those sins by rising from the dead. But that makes it a little too simple. Tied up with a little Easter bunny bow on a basket full of chocolates. And the same may be true if we only look at the high points of a person's life. They were born on a cheery day, filled with the love of their parents. They took their first steps, went to kindergarten, graduated high school, got into the college of their choice, or got their dream job. They had families and successes and lucky breaks and achievements. It's the kind of thing you hear at a funeral. What a contrast. 
And we know it's only half the story. The best half, usually. If we only see Palm Sunday's parade and Easter Sunday's empty tomb, we miss at least half the story. Between the parade and Easter, the events of Holy Week are filled with the ongoing ways that Jesus continues to confront and call out injustice. He overturns the money changers' tables in the temple. Remember that story? Not because he's against making money, but because these money changers were charging exorbitant exchange rates of the poor people who came from the outlying countries with their own currency. Jesus points out the widow, putting her last two pennies in the offering plate, not as an example of what it means to tithe, but in front of the Pharisees who are living off that offering in their wealth and grandeur. At her expense, she has to live like a pauper, dependent on her neighbors. The events of the week include the examples of the disciple who betrays we heard about, and the example of Peter, whose fear of being identified with Jesus makes him deny that he ever knew Jesus. He, he's the apostle who always is opening his mouth and sticking his dirty tennis shoe in. These events include all the people who said they'd follow Jesus anywhere and desert him. And he loves them anyway. Jesus' trial during this week is before the religious leaders, his own people, who can't hear his critique. And they can't bear to see the kind of love that Jesus lives. They only imagine their lives changing for the worse if what Jesus says comes true. And so they collude with the Romans. During this week, the Romans decide that Jesus has gathered too big of a crowd and he might be a threat. Jesus is murdered by the state. That's what happens between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Jesus has committed a capital crime, deserving capital punishment. He's made to be an example of, hung on a cross, and all the gore that that entails. These are gritty stories filled with controversy, and dare I say it, politics. Jesus was a political prisoner. Perhaps that why, that's why we don't want to look at the events between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. If we look too closely, closely we may be implicated Not all of us, all the time, but each of us, sometimes. And to our credit, often we confront the injustice. We critique the government. The church is the conscience of the systems. Solzhenitsyn said the line between good and evil cuts through every human heart. We are an exercise in contrasts. And we can't know the value of what's coming next Sunday unless we talk about death and the power of death in our culture. Let's be clear, death is normal. I think all you know that. What's the saying? Two things, well, maybe three are certain in life, death, politics, and potholes in Michigan roads? <laughs> I'll say it again. We are all going to die. If facing that reality ruins your parade day, forgive me. But your life is not unworthwhile because you're going to die. In fact, facing that reality may make your life's impact more beautiful more apparent, more worthwhile. 
to understand that we have limited time on this earth creates some urgency. It makes each day precious. And the reality of our impact more lasting. And the meaning of Easter, the power of life over death, becomes even more apparent when we contrast it with deaths that are not normal, like every person dying eventually of old age. Consider, in the world of God's dreams, 25,000 people, including 10,000 children, won't die of hunger-related causes every day. In the world of God's dreams, people in prison and on reservations don't die of COVID at three times the rate of the general population in this country. In the world of God's dreams, innocent people don't die of gun violence. Death indeed loses its sting when those death-dealing realities are lessened. And honestly, we can't see the value of the greatest designed political system in the world, yes, I'm talking about the U.S. of A, unless we can see the ways that we have not yet achieved a more perfect union. We can't see the freedom in our country post-slavery unless we look at the conditions of slavery and the situation for the descendants of slaves today. We can't see where racial justice still exists unless we consider where people of color still don't have access to what white people do. These are not easy things to consider. I know. And sometimes we don't want to hear them in church especially. But we need to know that we have power. We have the power to fix things. We have the power to see and assess and address things. Each of us have had some good times and bad times in our lives. Blessings and times when life got the better of us and we grew through it. Kismet and times when things didn't go the way we wanted them to, but we persevered. Successes and times when the diagnosis was traumatic, the failure was paralyzing, the brokenness was heartbreaking, but we recovered and we became stronger. The contrast is what being human is all about. The truth is yin and yang. The good coexists with the bad. Life balances out. The pretty isn't near as beautiful without the ugly. The joy isn't near as deep without the despair. When I lived in sunny California, it was so boring. I longed for the rain and the snow and the thunder and the clouds. I know, kind of crazy. On the parade route into Jerusalem, Jesus is riding on a donkey. A donkey is a symbol of peace. And the people are putting their cloaks in front of the donkey, reminiscent of anointing a king. And they're waving their palms, reminiscent of that day when they lived in tents made of palms after they escaped slavery. It's an evocative image. But it becomes even more evocative when you consider what was happening on the other side of the city of Jerusalem. Pilate was entering the city on huge white military horses with soldiers in full armor and the regalia of the oppressor Rome's flags waving overhead. That's a contrast. Sometimes the contrast in our lives compared to the ways of the world, create a significant witness. Loving the unlovable, creating restorative justice practices, welcoming those who are not welcomed elsewhere, encouraging kindness where there is only vitriol. 
the gritty, ugly, unjust, can be called out by the savvy, the beautiful, the creative. The contrast of lives well lived, authentic lives, with the lives lived carelessly and selfishly can be a powerful, Jesus-like dose of reality. Amen? Amen. 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 I invite you, oh, one second, sorry, Ramona. <laughs> I invite you this week to join us to hear about more of the events of Holy Week. On Monday, Thursday, there's an opportunity, and I invited those of you who can make it and want to be readers to see me after to get a reading part. There are also two Good Friday services in our community, 12 Stations of the Cross at St. John's Episcopal at noon on Friday, and at Peace Lutheran Church, a more a traditional Good Friday service at 7 p.m. Please join us where you're able. <laughs> Please join in our commission. Our church will provide a place and direction for joining with God, healing the broken, and educating youth and adults. We are challenged by our faith to reach out to our congregants, our community, and world family, and to offer opportunities for spiritual growth and renewal. We welcome all into our Christian family. This is our mission as a church of Jesus Christ. I invite you all to the best Fulton room after the service to stay for a project of making t-shirts without uh, recycling bags out of t-shirts without sewing. I'm so curious to see how this is done. And there's a great banner down there where you can sign your name as someone who cares for creation. Please join us as you are able. And now this poem, another lesson in contrast, a blessing as you go, by Nancy Paddock, a white woman poet. Lie down with your belly to the ground. 
like an old dog in the sun. Smell the greenness of the clover leaf. Feel the damp earth through your clothes. Let an ant wander the uncharted territory of your skin. Lie down with your belly to the ground. Melt into the earth's contours like a harmless snake. All else is mere bravado. Let your mind resolve itself in a tangle of grass. Lie down with your belly to the ground, flat out on ground level. Prostrate yourself before the soil you will someday enter. Stop doing, stop judging, fearing, trying. This is not dying, but the way to live in a world of change and gravity. Let go, let your burdens drop. Lie down with your belly to the ground and then rise up with the earth still in you. People of God, be in peace. Amen. Amen.